I listened to uh, a few interviews that you had with, with other people before this conversation. And I heard you talking about an email you received um, about a huge cod that had 15 hooks on its lip or something like that. And um, basically this person asked you, if fish are so smart, why is this animal constantly taking my bait and getting hooked? I'm not sure if you can still remember that email specifically, but yeah. would you be able to, yeah. to give you, like, how would you answer that kind of question? Yeah, look, I mean, I get, I get asked this kind of question repeatedly, um, almost always from fishermen. Mm. They say, oh, you know, I keep going back to the same place and I, I've caught the same fish three times. And um, my, my simple answer to that is, imagine you're in the forest, you're lost and you're starving and a hamburger drops from the sky. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to grab that hamburger and shove it in your gob, right? I mean, that's what you're going to do because you're starving. And the reality is that wild animals are hungry all the time because there's simply not enough food to go around, right? Humans have trouble relating to that because we can just open the fridge and help ourselves. But the reality is wild animals are in that state. So it actually makes far more sense that the fish repeatedly attacks the bait than not. Mm. That's not to say that, you know, they don't develop a hook shyness or, or what have you. They can do. And, you know, one of, one, if you speak to fly fishermen in particular or, or even people who use um, spinners, lures, you can't use the same fly and or lure over and over again because the fish learn that mm. you know that's not a thing that you can eat. So that, I mean that's one of the things about fishing from a technical perspective is that you should be changing baits and lures and things all the time because the fish learn. Uh, and of course fly fishermen, a really good fly fisherman will walk around the area that they're planning to fish and look at the sort of insect diversity you know what's abundant is it a moth is it a grasshopper or what have you and then they'll get out their fly kit and they'll pick something that mimics what's actually abundant at that particular time and so again from a fish's perspective if you're doing that can it ignore every grasshopper that you know, it comes down past it. No, it can't because it's going to starve to death if it does that. So, you know, there's lots of good reasons why fish are repeatedly caught, the same individuals over and over again. And sometimes, let's not forget that the fish might be so hungry that it decides that the, the cost, if you like, of having a painful experience of being hooked is actually better than starving to death. Uh, and we know that animals do make those kind of trade-offs. Um, there were some classic examples uh, from, let me think about 2005, 2008, where basically researchers gave fish the opportunity to hang out with friends or get access to food. But in order to do that, they had to go through an area of the fish tank where they would receive an electric shock. Mm. <clears throat> now, it turns out that fish are so attracted to, to their friends that they're willing to, to get shocked so that they can get access to their mates um, because their schooling is a thing. And in fact, if you shock them, their preference is even higher for, for social uh, comfort because that's what fishes often do. You know, they, when, you, when they're scared or anxious, that their social preferences are enhanced because they like to school. That's mm. their, their way of dealing with danger. Yeah, just to be clear, when, when, a, you, when you say mates, you don't mean sexual mates, you mean like friends, like the, the ones friends. that... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it could be mates either. Yeah. I mean, but not necessarily, yeah. Not. No, that's right. Um, and when they offered them food, if the fish had been starved for more than two days then the fish decided that the trade-off of getting shocked in order to get access with food was sufficient. Mm -hmm. So they were willing to pay the cost of getting shocked so that they could eat. And so that, you know, trade-off again speaks to why fishes, hungry fishes, even if they know there's a chance that they're going to be hooked, they're still willing to take the risk in order mm -hmm. to get access to the food. Right. So it, it, there's some sophisticated things going on there. Mm -hmm. it just highlights how disconnected we are from the experience of the, the individual wild animals who haven't got the 
the, the fast food and the, the air conditioning and the, and the supermarkets that we have to make our lives so comfortable. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, I think on the whole, you know, we like to romanticize about um, the life, life of wild animals, but it's, it's a lot harder out there in the real world than we imagine. Would it be fair to say that the majority of fishes on, in the oceans are coming from parents that are having lots of offspring? Is that the most prevalent reproductive strategy that we see? Yes, definitely. By far and away, the most common strategy is basically the lottery system where you produce heaps of relatively cheap eggs broadcast them into the to the world and let it go it's up to chance mm. um, that's not to say that there aren't a good number of individuals that have you know live bearers so they produce you know live offspring in the same way that we do give birth to live offspring and there's a whole bunch of nest dwelling species that um, you know look after their young in nests until they're relatively independent and I dare say that the number of fishes that do those things would be more than all the mammals combined. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just keep a perspective on that as well. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so definitely, definitely the case that uh, more individuals are doing the broadcast lottery system. And from a welfare perspective, obviously, you know, the likelihood that any of those individuals survive is very, very slim, whereas the, you know, the individuals that are reared or look, looked after by their parents or live birth at a decent sort of size, their chances of survival are much higher. It, it seems reasonable then to suggest that the vast majority of wild fishes are dying in infancy, because we know that for a population size to remain stable, uh, each parent can only have one offspring on average that, that makes it to adulthood. Um, so this is kind of a, a very um, sort of, it's kind of a scary idea I mean, we're not, we're not seeing all of this suffering, but it's just like this theoretical reason why it may be the case that they're all dying. Most of them are dying in infancy, the vast majority. Yes. Well, I mean, look, given infinite resources, which don't exist, mm -hmm. um, then I suggest that many more would survive. But um, look, I mean, most of them get killed by predators and, and the rest are all competing, not only amongst themselves, but amongst all the other animals mm -hmm. for access to food and shelter and all these sorts of things. So it's a pretty cutthroat world, um, but you're right. Um, your suffering in the real world is huge. There's no doubt about that. The mm. wild life of, of your average fish is pretty intense and it's pretty short. You know? Although we have you know, like the Greenland shark, which can live 300 years or 400 years or whatever, the vast majority of fishes, their their lives are going to be over in days to weeks. Mm. And the, the the sad reality is that if if the resource if there were more resources, then the the number of individuals would increase until mm -hmm. the natural state of starvation and misery is restored again. It seems to be. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, I want to I want to to do a hypothetical and, and imagine your ideal world. Say, if you were yep. God, if you were God. Yeah. If I was God. Yeah. Um, would you like to see humans working towards reducing the suffering of wild animals? So we're talking about, we've talked a lot about welfare, uh, the welfare of the animals we're killing. But if the majority uh, of, of animals on the planet actually live in nature, and we have reason to believe that they're living very short lives full of suffering, do you think that I, ideally... And I, and then I guess there's two, there's two separate questions, whether it's bad what's happening to them, which we'd agree it's like, this is a problem. And the second question is whether we can do anything about it. Now I want to like jump over that practical question because, because it's such a, a hard thing to do something about it right now. And we need far more research and the movement to reduce wild animal suffering is a very fringe movement in its infancy, I suppose. But ideally, I mean, would you, would you like to see a world where we're trying, to, where we're helping these animals suffer less? Yes, but gosh, I mean, there, there are much bigger questions. Uh, I mean, the first first thing is why do why do we feel pain? And although we've talked about um, death as a sort of endpoint, mm. 
Um, you know, pain is a lot more than that and suffering is a, mo a lot more than that. If you think about stress and anxiety and all of these things, they're actually there to help animals survive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that sounds a little bit crazy, but that's why they exist. Mm. Um, and if we think about, let's just think about um, fight and flight responses, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when you're faced with a predator, your body goes into shock, your brain goes into shock, but you're pumped full of chemicals that basically prepare you for a fight or, or to run or swim or whatever as fast as you possibly can. Mm. Um, and so that that actually is about survival. And, and same with pain. I mean, the reason you feel pain and experience pain mm. is that you don't go on hurting yourself over and over. Right? You actually do something. You change your behavior to make sure that you get better. Mm. And so I, I would argue that pain and suffering exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. And unless you came up with an alternative way of signaling to the organism mm. uh, that something's wrong and it needs to change what it's doing, mm -hmm. uh, there's not really an alternative. So as the thing is, I, I'm not talking here about abolishing suffering and abolishing pain in the same way if we were to think about humans suffering in the third world uh, and i said you think we should ideally help them i guess i wouldn't expect someone to say well you know like if if we abolish pain then there's going to be other problems and it might lead to more suffering it's like okay yes but but there's there's got to be a lot of long hanging low hanging fruit here that we can make to reduce their suffering um hypothetically i i could imagine things like altering ecosystems so the majority of animals are case selected and have a small number of offspring having more animals in the wild like elephants and less animals like small rodents and insects if insects can suffer um i, I suppose we don't need to necessarily go to the extreme and say well you're trying to abolish suffering because we don't see that in a human case we still try to, to reduce their suffering um do you, do you see where, I, where i'm coming from with that yeah I, I totally understand but the trouble is all of these different animals that we're talking about with different life history strategies play mm. different roles in the mm. ecosystem. And although they, you think that they are little entities that you can just pull out and throw away, you can't do that because that's not how ecosystems function. Mm -hmm. Everything relies on everything else and everything is interconnected. So mm. if you decided to remove all the case selected animals or the R selected animals or whatever, the system would collapse and none of the animals would exist. Yeah, I, so, you know, I, I certainly, I certainly can't wouldn't. Be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's just a, a, a crazy hypothetical, like one day maybe, yeah. but like, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we like go into it, it, ecosystems now and start making these huge changes. Uh, I think um, there are lots of low hanging fruit changes we can make possibly potentially in terms of wild animal suffering, harms were already causing them. You know, we're using insecticides. We can switch to more humane insecticides. We're trapping and killing wild pigeons. We could just uh, use contraception on pigeons. That's, that's one option, perhaps, using contraceptives on wild animals so that they have a smaller number of offspring so they don't all have to yeah. die miserably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd probably use a poor yeah, example. So I, th I, th I think that's a good, the good, um, a good argument to have and one that probably everybody should be thinking about. I think the sad reality, mm. and I'm always thinking about this from other people's perspective, most of these management, let's call them management strategies about removing pest species or controlling, it, it's driven by economics. Mm. And at the end of the day, if it's cheaper to shoot a pigeon than you know, take it to the vet and do some sort of surgical procedure so that it doesn't have babies anymore, I mean, how much would that cost? Would mm. it even be feasible if you think about how many pigeons there are in the world? Um, there aren't enough vets. There isn't enough time. There's not enough money. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but but again, again, I would say we, we there don't. Are alternatives. Sorry, the, the, a, I, I literally have to go let this cat in because he's gone crazy outside. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, sorry about that. The more I can have the cat indoors, the less likely the cat is to be ripping an animal to shreds outside. <laughs> it's not actually my cat, but I do like it. Um, yeah, I would we just say... I, I would controls just... in Australia for that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I would just say that, um, again, um, we don't need to think about giving contraception to all pigeons and, and abolishing pigeon suffering. Even if, even, if I, even if we reduce one pigeon suffering, that would be the, the world would be a slightly better place. Um, yeah. I, think, I think it's probably... Um, 
it's so easy to, to think about this more abstractly and broadly and like to think about solving the problem. I think as humans, we have a, a bias to, you know, we'd, we'd rather we'd rather solve a problem 100% to help 10 individuals than save five, like help deal with 1% of a problem to save a billion. And that's not really rational, right? We just care about reducing as much suffering as possible. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say next? Uh, I don't know, but I think the concept of reducing suffering wherever possible mm. is something that everybody should be doing and thinking about. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, the, the well-being of, of the wild animal is so often forgotten. And, and, we, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about these, these examples that might seem kind of crazy, like contraception or, or changing ecosystems, um, even though contraceptives have already been used in wild animals, of course, <laughs> um, but so it's not very well known. But uh, um, again, the, the question of what we can do, it's, it's so hard to, to think about that and give good examples when we've never really tried to help wild animals suffer less. Um, yeah. on, on like a, right now, we just need to do the research. We need more research looking into the lives of wild animals, what they're, what they're actually experiencing. Um, and yeah. a, a good start, I suppose, something we can do now is just start raising awareness about the, the perspective of the individual and the lives of the wild animals and just wild animal suffering more broadly. You know, the, the, this, this myth that nature is this like beautiful, wondrous thing. Um, it's, just, it's just so far, so far removed from reality. 